All right, Dave, how are you today? I'm good. You excited today? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Awesome, me too. I'm excited about this series here on the Creed. It just uh, just gives us a deeper understanding of what we believe as Catholics, and it's really awesome. You yeah, know? and and we're just talking for like what 15 minutes on the different parts, like yeah. the, the different articles, and that's not even enough. So yeah. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, it's really just scratching the surface, getting people thinking a little bit more deeply about what we believe I, and what we say when yeah. we're in mass. That's right. You know, I would go. I would go though to. You know, in following up to this, I would go to the cate- great catechisms of the mm-hmm. Catholic Church. You know, the yeah. obviously the catechism of the Catholic Church, the, the present one, but also the older catechisms like yeah. the Council of Trent or Pius X, which are really Baltimore. very good. The Baltimore Catechism. Yeah. Just, you know, go back and find those. You'll get a lot more. A lot more. But, you know, this is a good way to get things going. So. Yeah, yeah. So today we're going to talk about the Paschal Mystery which is the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which for me is the most emotional for me. Whenever uh, that comes up, uh, uh, Mel Gibson was so prolific in displaying our Lord's passion in that movie, the, you know, the Passion of the Christ. And I always think of, you know, those scenes. When I meditate, I always think, I don't know why, but I think of that and, and what he endured. So it's, it's, uh, it's a, uh, the most emotional part of the creed for me. Well, the saints uh, have always said that one of the most efficacious uh, practices that any Christian can do is to meditate on the cross of Jesus. Mm. So, you know, that's that's important to do. And it's important to have something in our minds when we're thinking about that. Yeah. Um, and it it's uh, it's funny, a lot of people will maybe argue that, hey, you know, the gospels don't talk a lot about the passion. So why do we make such a big deal out of it? Like wasn't wasn't Mel Gibson's movie over the top? I mean, like it, it just is kind of like a blip in the gospel that Jesus is crucified and scourged. You'd be you'd be surprised. A lot of contemporary biblical scholars really, really try to de-emphasize the cross of Jesus. And they do that by saying that it's not really treated in detail in the uh, gospels. And you could argue the same thing from the creed. I mean, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. It's very, very straight and quick. They don't describe the wounds or how many there were or you know how they were inflicted. Um, but I'd like to suggest a really simple reason for that. Well, of course, the fact that he was crucified, died, and was buried is the most important part, but you also didn't have to describe Roman crucifixion to anybody. It was standard. It was, and everybody saw it, you know, like, right. so like, so they, oh, there's the, you said cross in the ancient world and everybody shuddered because they had right. a, a visual come to their That's mind, right. yeah. you know, like, and they would see people crucified on the road or outside the city. And, and so they knew what that was about. Even young children knew what that was about. So uh, of course they didn't need to elaborate saying it straight was enough. Uh, dare I say that we don't quite live in times like that, and we're very like historically distanced from that. And so as a result, we need to be reminded, whereas the people For in the sure. early church, the time of the gospels, the time of the creed, didn't need to be reminded. In fact, the apostles who wrote the Apostles' Creed the cross was always present to them because it was always a real and true possibility. And for many of them, they died that way. So for what it's worth. And it was stipulated and stated in the in the Gospels where you, you have to carry your cross. Right. So it's mentioned many times yeah, as a reference. Yeah, it would have been like, people are like, what? Right, right, <laughs> right. Ew. Like, yeah. That would have been yeah. the reaction of right. people. Exactly. When we don't react that way, which is maybe part of the problem, we should, mm-hmm. we should realize that what Jesus is asking is yeah. really severe. Um, but this line um, of the creed, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. I think is an important one for us to at least get at, because I think there's a lot to it. Um, so maybe, you know, the next time we'll talk about the passion itself and what Jesus endured. But mm-hmm. but I think I'd like to hit on a few things about this line that I that are pretty significant. So, you know, when the creed says he suffered under Pontius Pilate, this is a very, very important thing because there's this attempt to situate Jesus historically. Pontius Pilate was the Roman procurator in the area of Jerusalem, um, and he reigned there as governor for a particular period of time. 
And he was the one who was the one who oversaw the trial of Jesus and eventually conviction of Jesus. So he would have been the one, like, you know, whose signature was in the roll books of like people who are crucified um, when it came to Jesus. So I think uh, we can glean a lot from this. It's not unlike what, let's say, Luke does in his gospel when he's talking about the birth of Jesus and he's going through all the different people who were rulers in the different regions at the time. Like, he's trying to say, no, this was a real event, a real person who was born in a particular place at a particular time, and sort of like doing that with the creed. This is a real person, a real right. event. He really died. He was really crucified at a particular time in a particular place. And the reason why that's important, it not only testifies to the fact that God became man at a particular moment in history, but it testifies to the fact that this isn't a made-up story and a myth. Sometimes what you'll hear from people is that Christianity is just a myth, because in some of the ancient myths, you have you know, gods being born, right? Or you have resurrection narratives, or you have, you have different stories that seem in different ways like they could be a basis for the Christian story. But what makes Christianity different than those is that it has a historicity to it, mm. okay? None of those gods were actually claimed to be born in a particular place at a particular time on, you know, Roman, you know, books. Right. Like, and yet this is exactly what's being claimed about Jesus. His death was real, and it was a death, and he was crucified. His birth was real, as Luke depicts. Mm -hmm. And here's who was ruling, and this is what was going on, and it's in this moment in history— boom, that this took place. Yeah. So it goes to, I think, great lengths to dispel the idea of a like mythic reading of Christianity as if it's just a made-up story like other ancient myths mm -hmm. because it's so historical. And then you have, of course, you know, I always like to say, ask the apostles who gave up their lives, you know, for testimony to Jesus Christ if it was a myth. Right. Because then you have that. Mm -hmm. You know, you have people don't typically die for myths, you know, <laughs> like, so yeah. anyway, so for what it's worth, I think that that's important to focus on this Pontius Pilate. I mean, how is it that the guy who's responsible for executing Jesus finds his way into the creed? Yeah. Well, there's a reason. Yeah. There's a reason. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, there's more to it than that, but. And is it not also a statement to admit that Jesus suffered? Yeah, it's a big statement. It's a big statement. And the reason is because of what we believe about who Jesus is. If Jesus were just a man, then the fact that he suffered on some level wouldn't be a surprise to us. It wouldn't be anything new. But it's the fact that Jesus is totally God, that, that he is a divine person with two natures that are completely united, a divine nature and a human nature, that is the revolutionary thing. Because this statement means that we have to be able to say that God suffered. Hmm. Now, at first blush, the idea that God suffered seems preposterous. I mean, how could God suffer? For a few reasons. One is that suffering would imply that there was a change in God. Obviously, that at one point he wasn't suffering, and at some point now he is. It also implies a certain duration, like that somehow God is bound by time, because change and time are sort of interwoven with each other, which clearly God is outside of time, he's eternal. And then on top of that, you've got this idea that, well, God is suffering for our salvation, which means somehow human beings are able to dictate God's suffering, are able to be the cause of God's suffering. So this infinitely small in comparison to God creature somehow has power 
to make him suffer. That sounds ridiculous. So yeah, so I, at at first glance, it's like, well, God can't suffer, but God became man in Jesus, and Jesus is totally God. And so when we say he suffered, we now are able to say, yes, God suffered because God became man. Well, couldn't you say that God didn't suffer, but Jesus did? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. And, and there were some people in the early church who tried to solve this problem this way. The one that comes to mind is Nestorius. Um, Nestorianism tried to make the claim that Mary was the mother of Jesus, but not the mother of God, that somehow Mary was the mother of the human nature but like, you know, obviously Mary wasn't the mother of the divine nature because how could God have a mother? That would mean God had a beginning and God had no beginning. And therefore, how can Mary be the mother of God? So what Nestorius said is Mary's the mother of Jesus, but she's not the mother of God. So it's, it's a similar point, like, but on a different issue, hmm. particularly with regard to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, the church decided no. The, the, the magisterium said no. She is the mother of God. She's the Theotokos. Why? Because it would create a division in the person of Jesus. So you cannot separate out Jesus' human nature from his divine nature. He is com the hypostatic union means complete and total union of both natures in the person, the divine person. So like, so because of that, anything predicated of the one has to be able to be predicated of the other. And the minute you do that split, you've actually said something wrong about Jesus. So many people might not realize that a lot of Marian doctrines are Marian doctrines so that we don't say something wrong about Jesus. So when we call Mary the mother of God, she has to be the mother of God. Because if Jesus is God and Mary's the mother of Jesus, she also is necessarily the mother of God. Otherwise, you're saying somehow Jesus isn't God or that those two natures are separate in Jesus, in the person. And you can't. You know, you know what gets confused? It's, it's tough to wrap your mind around it. You know, what, what, it, what, to me, what's confusing about it is the literal co intention of Mary being the mother of God. It's really Mary being the mother of Jesus who has divine nature of, as well as being part of the Trinity I think it's because we have this tendency to separate the divine and human natures of Jesus from yeah. the person of Christ. And the, the fact of the matter is that those aren't separate. Um, and so, for example, like when you go to heaven, the Son of God's not going to be there in the heart of the Trinity and Jesus is going to be walking around over here. From now, from the incarnation on, the eternally begotten Son of God now is forever united to the human nature of Jesus, you know, whereas they're, they're one divine mm -hmm. person. Yeah. So there is no separation in heaven. So we have to imagine that the minute Jesus is conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the, the, the moment that God becomes man, that is the Son of God. That's a, great way, that's a great way that you can understand that, you know, because when people are thinking of God, they're thinking of eternity. Right. That's what's hard to wrap your mind right. around it. But that was a great explanation you just gave. So, yeah. so it's, if Mary is the mother of Jesus and Jesus is, is God, yeah. Mary has to be the mother of Makes God. Makes sense there. So then, you know, relate it to the suffering well, Sure. Mm -hmm. If Jesus suffers on the cross, we can't say Jesus suffered, but the Son of God didn't suffer because it would be falling into the same error. Mm -hmm. you see? Gotcha. So, yeah. so that's a big statement yeah. to say that he suffered, you know, in addition to the Pontius Pilate part. Well, we, our next session, we're going to talk a little bit more about the suffering of Jesus. Yes. Um, the passion in more detail. Yeah, that'll be important. Okay. Awesome. Great. Peace. Great session, Dave. Great. Peace. Bye.